Hello, this is Terry Norrington from Kunganisha Ministries, and this week we've been looking at Acts 23. Uh, as per usual, we'll look at some verses followed by some commentary. Let's start off with uh, verses 1 to 8. So Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realise that he was the high priest. For it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees, Sadducees say that there is no resurrection. There are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. If anyone faces difficult circumstances while doing God's work, he will walk with us in these situations and eventually provide a way out. God wants our missions to be completed and it is logical that God will help us through to the end. The circumstances may be tough and our resolve and faith in him may be tested, but this is our training ground. Remember the parable of the bags of gold in Matthew 25. A master went on a journey and left five bags of gold with one servant, two bags with another and one bag with a third servant. On his return, he found that the first two servants had doubled the gold and they had been given that they had been given and were rewarded with more. The third servant had, had buried his gold and it hadn't even gained interest. The master was unhappy with the third servant and he was punished. If we are doing God's work, we will be rewarded even if the going is difficult. In our passage today, Paul is provided with a way out of his dangerous encounter with the Jewish Sanhedrin. Because the Sanhedrin was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, these two Jewish factions did not see eye to eye on doctrine, particularly with regards to resurrection. So Paul was able to stir these two Jewish orders against each other. But this passage also reminds us about division. The last figures released showed that there are 41,000 Christian denominations globally. Many will have their different doctrine, ways of worship, and ideas and what is important to them. But what should be most important is Jesus Christ, and this should be a unifying factor. Unlike the Sanhedrin in this Paris passage, we shouldn't let differences get in the way of what is most important, the message of Jesus Christ, and our need to proclaim that message across all nations. Verses 9 to 11. There was a great uproar and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him to, into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. <coughs> so how do we handle disputes and disagreements? Do we insist on being right, no matter what it takes? Some people are so adamant that they are right, that they will get angry and resort to violence in order to get their own way. But this isn't the way Jesus would resolve an issue. Yes, we saw him overturning the tables in the temple courts, but this was a righteous anger and nobody got hurt. 
in Matthew 10, as we as he is sending out his disciples in pairs, he gives them this command. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who is in it is worthy. <coughs> Excuse me. And there abide till ye go to, go thence. And when you come into a, a, a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Jesus advises his disciples to walk away if they have if, you, uh, have, if they have to say what they have to say is not accepted, and their peace will return to them. It is not necessary to enforce our point of view on somebody. We can be content in knowing the truth, and if others do not accept it, then walk away. Of course, anything we say must be said out of love. When we are preaching the gospel, we do so out of love, hoping that we will bring more people to Christ and save souls. Getting angry and insisting that our point of view is accepted isn't acting out of love. We can be satisfied that we have delivered our message and we have been obedient to God. In the presence of Paul and the Roman authorities, the Pharisees and Sadducees become violent towards each other. They were so opposed to each other's point of view that violence erupted. There was no act of love between them. The Pharisees and the Sadducees could not agree, agree over resurrection, and they could not over, agree over how to deal with Paul, so much so that it threatened to split the Jewish hierarchy. <clears throat> we have pointed out before how Christianity can be in danger of split because different denominations cannot agree over doctrine. But this shouldn't be the case. As Christians, the loving thing to do is to put our differences aside and be united in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a man of love and peace, and this is what we need to show the world. We don't do that if we don't do that if we are divided. We must unify in his name. Verses 12 to 15. The next morning, some, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had caught, killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat until uh, anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pre pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. It doesn't rain, but it pours. The same which suggests that someone has experienced one trial after another. Here in England, we have just experienced a long period of rain. and In some parts of our country, they have had the horrendous ordeal of flooding. And now the rain has stopped, we are getting a real cold blast of weather with the threat of snow. I'm sure that there are many parts of the world that suffer even greater weather related problems than us. And others will bro be broken by natural disasters, disasters such as earthquakes, of which I'm currently aware at least three areas in the world that are recovering from such a problem. And I'm sure many, if not all of us, have had periods of trouble. And just as we seem to be getting through them, Another crisis comes along. In the passage of Acts 23, verses 12 to 15, the Apostle Paul seems to have escaped the wrath of Jews. The next morning, some of the Jews make a vow to kill Paul and devise a plot to snare him. Making vows is not a good idea. In the case of the Jews here, they vowed not to eat anything until they had rendered Paul dead. We shall see that Paul's mission will continue. So these Jews were either going to starve themselves to death or break their, that vow. Study Judges 11 verse 30 to 35 and see how, how the vow of Zephath made to God came back to haunt him. For Paul though it must have seemed like it doesn't rain but it pours as the Jews seem relentless in their pursuit to wipe him out. But God is with him and his mission will continue as, sh as we shall see in further studies. 
and this should leave us with a positive message. Despite what seems like an onslaught of trials and tribulations, God is with us, and for those who focus on him during these overwhelming times, he will bring us through the dark valleys to see the light and the glorious views from the mountaintop. Sixteen to twenty two. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand drew him aside and asked, What is it you want to tell me? He said some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. In Ephesians 6, we read this. Finally, my, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to withstand all the evil, the in, stand in the evil day, and have done all to stand. There is a battle raging in the spiritual world, and many of us can feel that from time to time, from that from time to time. And the Apostle Paul is experiencing this, as we read in our study passage. Some Jews are plotting to kill Paul. They want the Roman authorities to bring Paul in front of the Sanhedrin under the pretense of wanting further information. The Jews who had vowed to kill Paul wanted to ambush them and they, on their journey, and this is the work of Satan. But Paul's nephew had overheard the plot, and Paul tells him to report this to the Roman commander. This he does. This is the work of God's angel and as, as they work to protect Paul against the attack of the enemy. Today we have battles in the spiritual realm, and we can feel this happening. We can feel the energy sapping effect of our different trials as we journey to do God's work, and sometimes we may feel like giving up. But then God will have his army bring some encouragement, some positive news, or someone to help you get, out to, get, get back to being in the hands and feet of Jesus as we seek to build God's kingdom here on earth. Ephesians 6 gives us further advice on how to protect ourselves in these spiritual battles. Stand therefore before your Lord, having your loins, girt, loins girt about with truth and having on the, the breastplate of right and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of the salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with, with all perseverance and supplica supplication for all saints. We have to put on the armour of God in the fight against the foe, and the book of Revelations tells us that we are on the winning side. God wins. 23 to 25. Sorry, 23 to 35. Then God called of his uh, called of his two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at night at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken, uh, taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias, who is Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. 
This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman, Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation, uh, accusation had to do with the questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I, was, I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived at Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's place. The Jews certainly saw the Romans as the enemy and had a very poor view of them. Yet in the Bible, there are some very positive stories of the Romans. In Matthew 8, we read about the Roman centurion who'd had compassion for a servant who was dying. He called upon Jesus to heal his servant, and Jesus declared that the servant was healed because the centurion's faith was so strong. Again, the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 27, when Jesus died on the cross and there was an earthquake, in verse 54, it was a Roman centurion who exclaimed, Surely this was the Son of God. In all the turmoil, he recognises... <coughs> Excuse me, Jesus' divinity. In Acts 10, we see Cornelius again as again a Roman centurion who has great faith. And through the Apostle Peter, he and his family are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And in our passage today, we see it is the Romans who are rescuing the Apostle Paul from the vengeance of the Jews. He is escorted to the governor Felix under the guard of Roman soldiers and cavalry to be protected until Paul's case could be heard in full. Sometimes people will, we perceive to be the enemy turn out to be on our side. Our initial thoughts and impressions can be totally wrong. We make false judgment of people. This may be because we are given false information or it has been something that that, something that person has said or done that has led us to consider they are against us. But when we truly get to know somebody, we can see that in actual fact, they aren't anything like we thought. They do share similar ideas and visions to ourselves, and that we might actually journey with them rather than fighting against them. Paul is now journeying with the supposed enemy, but God has purposely allowed this to happen. And in our journey with God, he may present us with people who initially it appeared to be on opposing sides, but they can help us to fulfil our work for God. So let us pray. Father, may you open your eyes to the people, uh, the people you place to walk alongside us. May we allow ourselves a time to get to know these people and recognise the shared visions that we have. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>